Right. Okay. Welcome everybody to the uh, Connected Cir Citizen webinar series. This is the number 11, I think, from the, the Connected Citizen series, which of course is all about digital transformation. And this afternoon, we're joined by Andrew Hunt for our first in-person webinar, Andrew. So great to have you here. Thanks, Google. It's great to be here. It's a real honor to do it face to face. Great. Well, we'll have a bit of fun with it and see how we go. That's good. Um, just while we're waiting for people to come in, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'll start out with just set a bit of a context in a couple of minutes, get a little bit about your background. Um, people can ask questions as we go, but we will go for about, Andrew will present for about 30 or 40 minutes and we'll leave, we'll leave time for questions at the end. But I think we'd much prefer if you ask questions as we go through the session. I'll pick them up and um absolutely I'm pretty relaxed. So, you know, if there's anything that comes to mind, just interrupt. Great. Uh jump in if you want clarification or a, a drop an acronym on you. Yeah. Uh, Good. So, yeah. And no questions, a bad question. Absolutely not. And you know, feel free to give Andrew a bit of stick. He used to work with our CEO Tom, and I've heard them in the office for the last couple of days giving each other a bit of stick. So what we like here is have a bit of fun as we Absolutely. as we do things. So um let's crack on into it. And I suppose to get us started, uh maybe give us a little bit of your background, Andrew. You know, where have you worked? What have you worked on? Um and, and what are you doing now? Great. Thanks, Fogel. Um, yeah, so uh audience, um I've uh been working for about 20, 30 years, and I was joking before with Fergal since last century, uh, yeah. which uh it's kind of hard to believe, right? But uh I started very young, uh, just to be clear. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I've, I've been working with the uh, big end of town uh, for yeah. uh, the last uh, kind of 20 years, uh, mainly in the mining, uh, oil and gas yeah. uh, space. And then uh, I had the chance to, uh, that was with a BHP. Uh, and then uh, after that, I worked with an engineering firm. And that's really where uh, Tom Hines and myself yeah. got to uh, work closely together for, uh, yeah, six, seven years. Yep. Uh, and that was really focused on sort of the asset management space, uh, you know, heavy engineering, um, you know, lots of public sector uh, type exposure. And then the last uh, almost 10 years with SAP, a big German software company. Uh, and, and I guess, um, you know, uh, software is a bit of a passion of mine, always has been. Yep. Uh, and I had the chance to work with a couple of different industries. And I think your follow-up part to that question was, you know, what, what, what am I up to now? Um, I thought I'd uh, pivot from the big end of town and focus on sort of the smaller to medium enterprise, yep. uh, tap into small, uh, you know, small business and really see if I can bring some of the learnings uh, from my uh, years in that sort of uh, large enterprise space uh, and share some of those learnings around, you know, change and, and AI and, and some of the technologies that I've had exposure to, uh, to really sort of uh, build capabilities in that space. And what I liked about it, I mean, a lot of your experience, obviously, around software rollouts, digital transformation, I think you've done a fair bit of supply chain type Absolutely. Uh, projects. Yep. yep. So the foundations of change and you, you, the, the 12 foundations are basically based on your experience running through those projects. And I think the other thing that was quite interesting is that part of it is about resurrecting projects that have kind of gone are on the way to going pear shaped and using these foundations to um to to bring projects back to life, I guess. Yeah, and it's funny, it kind of I think that's what makes me a little bit um odd is that I quite like the challenge, right? Yeah. So if there's a you know, if it's a clear sailing kind of um, you know, project, okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, but where I've been engaged historically. Um, is really around sort of um, reigniting uh, the passion uh, for the transformation that's being pitched. Yeah. So if, just imagine, um, you know, uh, you were rolling out AI in your organization and uh, the CEO that had sponsored the project had moved on. Yeah. Um, and then someone that comes in that's fresh and new is saying, well, why are we spending this money on this transformation? I want to do something different. And so resetting that justification uh, around uh, the transformation uh, was was an area that uh, I've had a lot of exposure to and I'm yeah. passionate about. Because if it's easy, okay, great. But if it's a challenge, okay, that's that's really kind of where the interest uh, lies. Of course. So people on this session, we've got IT managers, we've got some general managers. Um, what do you want them to look out for just before we get yeah, started? Fantastic. What, what takeaways do you want them to take? Well, what I'd love is every time I say foundation for change and then the words that I use after that, yeah. if they could write it down, 
uh, on a on a notebook if they use Notepad or whatever, and then just give themselves a rating out of ten yep. for, for where they're at in their, their experience. So let me give an example. One of the foundations for change is education, right? Yep. So if they were rolling out a software program uh, and there was no education associated with that deployment, maybe you give yourself, you know, a low rating. Yep. But if like you were inundated with training, there was online, there was time given uh, to focus and upskill in that space, you know, give yourself a higher score. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Let's crack on to it. Uh, bring up your slides. This session has been recorded, by the way, for anyone who's going to ask any questions. Uh, as usual, we'll put it up on YouTube for people to, to watch it after the event and to share with, uh, with their colleagues, etc. Um, I will try and keep quiet, Andrew, <laughs> through your presentation, but I, so I will good. ask so questions good. as I go. Don't if you're good. happy enough for me to ask the, the no, please questions. Do. Um, right. And look, just to... Just to for complete transparency, so I've used AI to generate this entire deck. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if there's any errors, um, bl blame Google. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, you know, it's it was a fun experience to kind of take my learnings over yeah. the years and take the research that, I, that I've, I've gathered and use AI to generate something that hopefully you'll find interesting yeah. uh, and, and compelling. Brilliant. All right, so let's jump into it. So just uh, look at this image for a minute and think about those various bubbles that you can see. So imagine you're undertaking a transformation around AI uh, and the vision is the transformation using AI, whether it's AI integration to your existing processes or whether it's using AI to complement some of the existing you know, human activities that are occurring. Well, what I've found is, you know, the traditional change components or the foundations for change uh, can be applied to the transformation. Uh, so there's kind of like a, you know, the, the number varies depending on whether or not it's one or two, but think about vision and justification for the vision, right? So you see a house here and the house is the idea or the concept. Uh, or, or, or the element of change that you're looking to deploy. And then the foundation of the steps that I've seen after you know, many, uh, over a hundred uh, different projects uh, that, that translate to a successful outcome, yep. okay? Now, whether it's the outcome that was envisaged up front or whether it's you know, something along the same lines, uh, we've found, I found that uh, you know, those components uh, are important to focus on. So let me just quickly whip around a few, and it doesn't have to be all of them, but uh, let me give an example. Yeah. Um, I was chatting to uh, an organization recently, um, I'm supporting a company called Control Tower Global, and, and they're rolling out um, a dashboard that visualizes yeah. where the freight is uh, for, the, for, for the customer. And the customer's turned on this dashboard and it's beautiful, it's pretty, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the customer wants to know where their expensive bit of freight is in the supply chain, yeah. right? So they've bought something out of China. It's a transformer. It's got to get to a remote location. Uh, and, and the users are saying, all right, we can see the dashboard. We can see the components. But how do we see where it is today, right? So uh, the company provides a coaching service. Uh, so that, that's a one-on-one -on -one coaching. So they jump on the phone. Uh, they sit with the user via Teams and they they share their desktop and they say, okay, click here, click there, and that's where the item is and that's the status it's in right now. Yeah. Right? Now, that sounds pretty cool, right? It's a coaching concept whereby you've got the designers of the solution and the customers of the solution using it at the same time. So I would argue that that's a fairly high uh, you know, success mm. uh, on the education um, foundation for change. Gotcha. Yeah, makes sense to me. Good one. Okay, cool. So the second uh, second example I want to talk to is, and, and let me jump into, you know, how the foundations, or what the concept is. So imagine you've got an idea, all right? And if you think about AI, uh, Fergal was sharing with me yesterday a whole lot of cool ideas uh, from a recent workshop that uh, he facilitated around AI transformation. Um, you take those ideas, once you've got the vision and justification sorted and the executive buy-in and so forth, then you've got to move to implement, right? So how do you move from a concept around the vision and the potential and, and who, who, who's going to do it? Um, you then move into that sort of development and ready uh, system readiness phase. 
Uh, and then you want to make sure that they embrace it, right? Yeah. Many projects that I've had the uh, opportunity to work on, um, you know, it's it's all good. We have a go alive and then people sort of wander off, yeah. right? And, and arguably uh, the expense and time and so forth doesn't necessarily translate into um, what I'm calling the embrace phase or the adoption phase. So let me ask you a question. And I didn't ask you this question in when we were preparing, but it's just occurred to me. So you go into a, a business, you know, they're getting set up for a transformation of some sort. Do you identify the behaviors? Now, you know, of those 14 foundations or 12 foundations, can you, you know, do you need to understand where the business is at now? And do you need to make those changes before the project starts? You know, if, if education isn't something that they're strong on, Obviously, you try and recognize that early in the piece and build that into the project. Is that a fair I, question, I suppose? I know that's a cracker. Yeah. Um, so I could give, give you an example. Um, uh, a civil aviation authority uh, that was undertaking change uh, con uh, conducted a workshop along these lines and, and they, they did what I asked, which is yeah. out of 10, rate yourself, right? So how are your people? Like, what is their persona? Are they going to be freed up to focus on the project? Um, in the past, what has worked and what hasn't worked yeah. uh, as you've deployed a change? Uh, and the CEO came back to me and said, listen, of all of the foundations for change, can we focus on the communication piece, the messaging, right? And I was like, yeah, well, we can spend as much time or as little time on any of them as you like. Yeah. But he shared with me that that's the space where they've traditionally fallen over, right? Yeah. So no one knows what's going on. They don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, and that's quite a common one, right? Yeah. So the beauty of doing the, as to your point, the research and the analysis up front, it, it, and with you know the the benefit of hindsight, you can take those low performing foundations and focus on those which traditionally translates to a more successful outcome. Yeah, I was looking at that slide yesterday. I think you're on um, one of the, I guess the most basic change management concepts that. That I've seen or been taught was the notion of ice, you know, that you unfreeze it, you kind of reshape it, and then you freeze it again. But you're yeah. going to have to, and we've talked about unlearning on this uh, podcast or this uh, webinar before, where you've got to, so sometimes you've got to unlearn the past before you move forward into the future. So, yeah, um, absolutely. I think you've answered the question. Yeah. No, that's a cracker. And yeah. look, just on that, um, the idea concept around AI yeah, and, and, you know, to pay back to you some of the content you shared with me yeah. yesterday. I believe a workshop that you conducted with a council, they flagged that after seeing, you know, something along these lines around transformation, um, you asked them, share us your no-brainers. How can AI help in mm -hmm. your day-to-day? -day? So I love that concept. And, and I think you shared about 40 different ideas that came from the councils you're working yeah. with. Um, now, I know it's me and interview you interviewing me, but um, <laughs> tell us, like, so what I saw was uh, from from those no-brainers, policy drafting. You know, imagine mm. using AI for policy drafting. There's a concept, right? Yeah. Uh, and I've I've actually seen it done. Yeah. And to be fair, what I've seen ain't great, right? Yeah. Not in the first draft, but it, it takes some of the pain away. And the, and the policy that I saw drafted was an HR policy, yeah. which is never straightforward. I was for, uh, for an ins a not-for-profit insurance company. And... What it gave back was a beautiful template, right? Yeah. Uh, but it then needed a little bit more of the human touch. It needed that sort of, of intellect. But the heavy lifting around starting the the, the policy drafting uh, was was done by AI. The other one that I really liked was, um, you know, correspondence for helping uh, in an emergency situation, which obviously mm. um, in councils is is quite a hot topic. Of course, yeah. Um, redesigning reporting and statistics, you know, that's heavy lifting for BAs yep. in their capacity. Uh, I know there's different AI models, some, you know, like the co-pilots or, or the, the Gemini and so forth, the, uh, Gemini, they, they use, uh, they do a fairly light, um, uh, you know, data analysis. Uh, and obviously there's restrictions and so forth, but I believe there's a lot larger, stronger, um, you know, dedicated AI for managing, you know, data lakes and so forth. Mm. Um, so I like that one. Um, automating uh, condition assessments, you know, um, thought leadership content, uh, which I've been using to to, to develop this deck. Yeah. Um, you know, um, recruitment, uh, standardizing position descriptions. Uh, these are some really cool ideas. Chatbots, 
um, you know, meeting recordings and so forth. I know there's some some pretty cool things in that space. Um, re reducing the duplication of efforts around, you know, paper. Yeah. Uh, that good old chestnut. Um, you know, managers are being interviewed around um, how to uh, leverage efficiency uh, and improvement initiatives, e-learning. Um, just to give just to give a few. Yeah. So it sounds like you had a good workshop. Yeah, absolutely. And there, look, there are use cases that we're trying to find within local government for AI, which which will drive change. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So did you want me to answer it? Sorry, was there a, did I miss the question? No, there wasn't. It was more of a compliment yeah. of what you're doing uh, yeah. without, um, you know, without blowing too much smoke. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear, okay, well, so the question really yeah. would be, okay, so you got the ideas. What now? Like, what would you do? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, we put in a framework, which is quite, which is why I'm really interested in this, um, which is really around teamwork. So you've got team cooperation in here. Um, what we what we recommend doing for something a transformation change that involves something like um, AI, for example, would be to put together a, a steering group and a working group that's uh, across across the organisation. Uh, so you're cross pollinating ideas from different departments. You've got different skill sets in there, uh, and you're giving people a safe uh, place to play. Okay, um, so that's how we would go about at the very highest level, uh, implementing some of this change. And look, I'd, as you go through it, I'll be ticking the boxes and the stuff that we would do, you would build in around there. So, you know, setting policies and governance and framework would be the first thing that you do. What are the rules of the game? Um, education, absolutely part of it. It's a bit of knowledge transfer and people learning on their own initiative as well. Um, talk about co uh, team uh, cooperation. Exec buy-in, so you've got a steering group, you want to have your CEO involved in any change initiative or at least a general manager. You need a champion who's going to be promoting what you do. Absolutely. So I think that that framework incorporates these, these foundations. Good. Uh, but I will be going, as you go through it, I'll probably pick jump up in, where, where, jump we in. Could be do, where we could be doing it better. Of All right, well, let's jump in yeah. um, because I, that that's that's gold. All right, so the vision I've talked to extensively already, but I'm going to read you a story uh, just because I like the sound of my own voice. Now, in all seriousness, I've got AI yeah. to write this, and I hope you would just give me two minutes while I read this because this is what I've seen happening uh, in, in, in the world in my experience in the last yeah. sort of two, three years. So once upon a time... So the vision, how, what was the question you asked uh, AI to generate the vision? I said, write me a story along these lines, yeah. uh, similar to Lord of the Rings. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. About what I've seen. Uh, and, and it gave me, I said, keep it short. Yeah. Um, so once upon a time in the vast bustling land of corporatalia, there existed a powerful artifact known as the profit ring. Yeah. Uh, forged in the fires of ambition, this ring granted its very immense wealth and influence for centuries, the great companies of corporatalia sought the profit ring, uh, believing it to be the key to their success. However, as the years passed, the land began to suffer. The skies grew darker, the rivers polluted, and the people corporatalia grew weary and disillusioned. It was then that the wise council of leaders, known as the guardians of ESG, emerged, and they believed that the true prosperity could only be achieved through a balance of environmental, social, and governance principles. The guardians of ESG embarked on a quest to reshape the vision of corporatalia, and they traveled far and wide, uh, spreading the message of sustainability, social responsibility, and ethical governance. Along their journey, they encountered various companies, each with its own unique challenges and opportunity. First, they visited the kingdom of green tech, uh, where, they, uh, where innovation and technology thrived. The guardians helped the kingdom harness uh, renewable energy sources, reducing carbon footprint, and setting an example for others to follow. Next, they journeyed to the realm of social equity, where they worked with the companies to ensure fair way, wages, diversity, inclusion. They encountered businesses, uh, they encouraged businesses to invest more in their community, creating more just and equitable society. Uh, in the domain of ethical governance, the Guardians promoted transparency and accountability, and they guided companies to establish a strong governance framework, ensuring that the decisions they made with integrity and the best interest of the stakeholders. The guardians, uh, as they continued on their quest, the land of corporatalia began to transform. The skies cleared, the rivers ran pure, and the people flourished. Companies that once solely pursued the profit ring now embraced the principles of ESG, realizing that the true success 
uh, lay in creating a sustainable equitable future. In the end, the ESG uh, guardians provided that the greatest power proved that the greatest power was not in the profit ring, but the collective commitment to a better world. Uh, so they thrived uh, and they changed their vision to achieve more ESG related outcomes. So that's an that's a beautiful uh, I think that's a cool little story about yep. sort of what I've seen happening in um, you know corporate in in the last couple of years. So bring it back into context. So let's say I'm running a I'm going to run a um, ERP rollout or a software rollout in a council. But how would you create this vision? How would you take that into that project? So is this something the project manager needs to do is cr create a story around that? Where Absolutely. End up? Look, I think if you can make yeah. it interesting and consumable yeah. and relevant, that's yeah. cool, right? Um, you know, rolling out an ERP into council, yeah. uh, it doesn't sound particularly fascinating. Um, yeah. You know, dri dri <laughs> driving, um, you know, getting people to buy into the vision mm. um, isn't always just from a top-down push. Um, yeah. you know, around the executive buy-in. Um, it's about creating something that's compelling and, and exciting yeah. that people want to invest in, um, often on top of the day job, right? So so you need to take a, above the software and say, right, when we, what I'm reading here, hearing here is that uh, we're saying we're going to put in an ERP, right? We're going to have funky software. Who, so what? But the outcomes are going to be, you know, a better community, better customer service. Uh, 100%. All those things. Absolutely. Taking it up a level and, and uh, making it more aspiration is really important. I think so. And I, my experience with council is often they're far ahead of corporate in this, right? Because they're it's already... the ESG stuff, absolutely. Absolutely, right? Yeah. So they're already invested in the communities. Yeah. They want the communities to thrive, Yeah. right? Um, they're wanting to foster, you know, those initiatives. And I think, you know, I'm preaching to the converted, but I think when you tend to talk to technology transformation yeah. and even AI runs into this danger, like, okay, so we're automating a couple of processes. How is that going to help? Right yeah. now, if you can reposition it and say, well, you know what, uh, the individuals that are currently doing these monotonous tasks are suddenly going to be freed up to focus on something that's more energetic, more sustainable, more stimulating, then you're going to get the parties on board, um, you know, yeah, more quickly. One of the things we're using here, we've only literally started in the last kind of month or so, but uh, Amazon and AWS have a working backwards framework. Yes, they use and the working back without getting into the detail of it is you start with a PO or a press release about when the project's successful, what are you going to say about it? Which is kind of the same. You're, you're, you're kind of talking about the outcomes and all the great things that this project has delivered before you've even started the project. And I think it's really important because it energizes everybody involved in the project. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things in that along those lines, and that's sort of similar to your ice yeah. concept, right? You've got to unlearn, you've got to refreeze, and then you've got something fresh, right? Yeah. Um, a, another customer that I'm talking to at the moment, um, as part of the contract discussions, I'm saying, hey, if you're successful, would you consider being a customer reference mm. for us, right? Yeah. And what does that look like? Does that look like, what do they, what do they want? What do they want to celebrate? Do they want to celebrate in front of an industry forum? Do they want to stand up at an expo and say, you know what, we did this and that yeah. and, and look at us, you know, haven't we done well? Have we, haven't we managed to manage the expenditure by our citizens in an effective way? And I love that because it gets everyone really clear on yeah. what the outcome needs to look like. I'm going to put it out to the uh, to the audience and um, I'm just interested anybody listening has any comments on um, vision in, in change programs or any questions. And I'll pick them up as we go and um, yeah, let's keep motoring along. All right, brilliant. Okay. Um, so, questions and comments, welcome. <laughs> absolutely. So I talked about education uh, real quick, but uh, I wanted to share another story from uh, a customer I'm chatting to at the moment and working with now, she's trying to roll out what's called in explicit instructions in schools in New South Wales. Yeah. And I said to her, hey, so these foundations of change include education. Now, when I took her through education, she was like, yeah, I get it. Like, we're going to teach them. And it's like, because she's a teacher, right? So yeah. education, she got, right? So then after education, I jumped to um, executive buying. And this one she struggled a bit more with because she's like, well, there's principals at school who are mandating that this uh, explicit instruction is going to be rolled out. It's part of the New South Wales education uh, mandatory uh, training. 
And so I said to her, tell me, how does that work? Like, what are you, what are you experiencing around executive buying? She says, well, if the principals are on board, it's not a problem. Yeah. She said, but where you've got a flaky principal or a principal that's sort of not that invested, doesn't necessarily get it, mm -hmm. um, how does this help, right? So we talked about expanding the stakeholders beyond uh, the principals and having that conversation, right? So the head of math, for instance, part of the content that she's trying to roll out includes predefined maths lesson plans, yeah. right? So the maths teachers are on board because they can see the value of the content that she's pitching, right? So I said, all right, so you've got to build, uh, you know, that executive buy-in from those that are um, buying, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid, right? Yeah. Those that are on board. So how do you build that consensus uh, if you don't have that top-down push? So that's executive buy-in, uh, Foundation for Change Executive Buy-in. Very quite difficult to um, to get that at times, you know, particularly in the busy, busy councils where there's a lot of thousand and one things coming at us. Absolutely. Uh, we've got one comment here from Duncan. Sometimes it is hard to get people to move away from the from the boring. We do project A for reasons X, Y, and Z. They think they think are silly. Uh, I think that's a fair. Uh, they think are silly trying to. They think you are silly trying to tell a story, but we have to keep trying. I think that's a fair point. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think Duncan, that's often a lens that technical people are. I think find it more difficult sometimes to see the to see the story. Um, I don't know that I have any uh, <laughs> immediate remedies for that, but uh, certainly people buy into stories and visions, and they want to be taken on a journey. And I think you know. As leaders, it's it's incumbent on us to tell better stories. Would be my answer. My answer to that. I think you've got to come. Yeah, I've got teenagers, mm -hmm. and uh, they've informed me that Dad, we are so inundated with information nowadays. Unless the message is real simple, it ain't gonna hit. Yeah. Right. So the story I just shared with you was pretty straightforward, right? Um, so if the messaging is overly complicated and traditionally in technology, yeah. uh, it's usually very complicated and there's a couple acronyms and there's some assumed knowledge as well, right? Mm -hmm. So if you need to um, uh, reduct the complication down to something that's simple, yeah. um, don't feel that um, you're, uh, you're being insulting. Uh, it's, it's more um, or condescending. It's more sometimes the message uh, just needs to be uh, clear and concise because otherwise it's going to get lost in the broader uh, messaging uh, mm -hmm. and noise that comes with the transformation. I mean, we were on a session on here on uh, one of the webinars in recruiting talent in, in local government and we had some uh, uh, recruitment people and HR people that joined us, our experts. And one of the ideas was that, you know, sometimes in the government sector, it's seen as a kind of a boring job. But that can really be turned on its head. You, yeah. you mentioned it earlier on. These, you know, people who really care about the community will want, should want to come and work here. Absolutely. Um, young people starting out in their career can get access to do really quite amazing things in a, in a government context around things like smart cities. I reckon AI will be perfect for for local government. So I think sometimes reframing a story can be very very powerful. Yeah, and you mentioned to me yesterday, Fergal, around one of the ideas around grant applications that came out of a council workshop. Yeah. I can tell you as a small business, uh, you yeah. know, starting out, that grant application process is a little overwhelming, right? So if there's some smarts around how to free up cash yeah. uh, or grant, um, app, you know, I know there's a lot that are closed, but if there's a mechanism that you can socialise uh, that's going to simplify that for the community. It's going to be a winner yeah. um, every time. All right, let's jump on. Was um, yeah. I hope we answered Duncan's question. Uh, I hope you're happy with that answer, uh, Duncan. You can tell, tell us if you're not. We'll have yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, the next one's around authority and governance. Um, so authority is... Uh, and I found this is different on the industry, right? Mm -hmm. So some industry is like, why do we need this? Like, why do we, this is what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was in Japan recently having a discussion there and and they struggled with this one because they're the Japanese culture I've noticed mm -hmm. has got a very, um, you know, servant master kind of relationship yeah. where if the, as the sellers of a product to a customer, if the customer says jump, they say how high, right? So there's no, yeah. there's just an assumed, obedience. Um, but the story I like to tell on this one is uh, a large retail grocer 
uh, has stores, all, like thousands of stores yeah. um, all over the country. And they were deploying a large piece of software. And as they were going through this change, they had so many different parties trying to service them. Uh, they were getting overwhelmed and they didn't know who was who. So uh, set, simply set up a, a triangle uh, with the decision makers and, and the customers at the top. And on either side of the triangle, there was a face off. You know, there was this person related to this person, this person related to that person. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that simple diagram meant everyone knew who they should be talking to on both yeah. sides. And the second piece that's really important, and we, we were having a chuckle about this yesterday, if you have a meeting um, and a cadence that's uh, to uh, resolve issues or um, uh, take actions and provide updates on the actions, if there's no notes during that process, and, and this sounds fairly obvious, but um, it's sometimes hard to have a record of what you previously agreed upon. Mm. Now, I know I get involved with a lot of different meetings, yeah. and sometimes it's too overwhelming to go back and capture the notes from that meeting where you may miss it. So this governance structure is really about setting up um, you know, a clear framework in which you can uh, all agree on how things are going to roll yeah. uh, with this change. And I think... Um... It's basic, but it's really important. Yeah, that, uh, stuff gets minuted properly. Actions get taken from each minute, uh, from 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 um, each meeting, um, and I think the other thing that becomes important is that me meetings are set up for a purpose. It's not meetings just for the sake of meetings. And I think we all get fall into that trap from time to time Absolutely. where we're going to all these meetings. We're running from one meeting to the next. And we're actually not doing the meetings correctly because we're trying to do too many absolutely so i think a, you know a, a project meeting that if it, it if it doesn't need to be once a week and it needs to be every once every two weeks do it once every two weeks but make sure it's done properly and that people are, are held accountable and i think as you say uh, you know it's obvious but it, imagine you're deploying an ai initiative yeah. that's your vision uh and you've got a whole lot of tasks you know like uh, you've got a list of people who's roles can be potentially um, supplemented through enhanced usage of Gen AI. Yeah. Uh, okay, so who's going to agree on which people, you know, wh which actions, which tasks, um, when, you know, how, wh why are they doing this, you yeah. know, and, and, and so forth. So if you think about that governance framework being applied to some actual, um, you know, uh, uh, a change, uh, that, then, then it's, it's, it's quite useful. So these, let's go take this back up a step. Um, we've gone through four or five of your um, yeah. of your factors now. Um, every organisation has got projects that are going well and projects that are not going so well. I think these are real good tips, particularly for projects that aren't going so well. Because you know we all start out on projects with the best of intentions, uh, but let's say you're coming in and you've got a, I don't know, well. We're on to uh, AI now, but previously, for the last probably four or five years, certainly in the local government, the government context, there's been a lot of stuff around smart cities. And, you know, I think some of those projects will have fallen apart in, in quite a few councils, is my guess. I don't know for a fact, but just in a, as an example, let's say you're going, you go into a client and there's a project that's kind of fallen apart or it's, it's lost its momentum or it's going nowhere. What do you do? Where do you start with these things, with the, with the, with the 12 foundations? And how do you start? Am I asking the question too early? or No, no, no. It's a good question. Now? In fact, I skipped yeah. a lot of that uh, okay. just because I knew you were going to ask me a tricky question. <laughs> uh, no, but in all seriousness, yeah. I go back to the vision and justification, right? Yeah. So uh, reset the justification. Yeah. So if you go to smart cities, for instance, I suspect... And I've, I've not seen the uh, the business case for the smart cities, yeah. but I suspect it's made up of probably three things, right? Yeah. When you get down to the dollars and cents. Mm. So the dollars are probably, if with a smart city, there can be some cost reductions through the centralization of people uh, and infrastructure mm. expenditure because, yeah. you know, um, it's more localized. Um, maybe this could be some efficiencies gained through uh, the simplification of X. And maybe there could be some enhanced compliance around safety and, and so forth. So whatever the justification was for the initial investment, mm. that needs to be resold, right? And the beauty of reselling it is the rose-colored glasses come back on, right? Yeah. So if you think about the, pers the perspective of those that want the smart city to win, 
they've got a new business case. They've got a new justification. Yeah. But you've got to reset that justification and you've got to have all the uh, senior leadership team, the execs and so forth. Mm -hmm. They need to sign off on that vision justification uh, again, right? Yeah. Uh, if they're new, uh, they're probably saying, why did the previous administration make these decisions? What were they thinking? Right. Mm. That, that's why they're no longer here. Right. Yeah. So sometimes you may need to go back to the drawing board and say, let's rebuild that business case justification. Yeah. Okay. The next one's outcome measurement. So outcome measurement's really back to the point we were making before. If you start with the end in mind, mm. how do you measure it? How do you measure uh, your war story? How do you measure you've been successful? Yeah. And you've got to have a scorecard. Uh, that's my view. And a scorecard means, and don't start with, uh, trying to boil the ocean, start with a couple, a handful. Mm. So imagine a scorecard for AI could be how many policies have we refreshed? Yeah. So you've got to start with, well, how many policies are there? Okay, so there's the first metric. How many have been refreshed? Well, the last one was in 1988. Okay. Um, you know, it's 2024. Uh, we want to have 10 done by 2025. So those scorecard um, uh, are really important. And a couple of things I've learned around scorecards is, First of all, there needs to be some uh, someone accountable for those scorecards and they need to agree on the day they're going to run the scorecard. Yeah. So they're going to run it on the 6th of September for August. Okay, so it needs to be the 6th of October and then it needs to be, so it needs to be the same cadence and it needs to be the same data set and they need to understand the data set and it needs to be clearly articulated. Yeah. So if you've got uh, the number of policies refreshed, well, what does refresh mean? Does it mean someone changed the font? Or does it mean a rewrite? Is there yeah. version control? Is there is it stored correctly? You know that that's there needs to be some thinking around that metric. Okay, um, I think there's dashboards. So you don't like I like the scorecard better than the dashboard. Um, I think sometimes you get tied up with the technology and the fact that we can measure it, but we don't always communicate it the way we should. Would that be a fair, a fair comment? Or I think that's gold. Um, yeah. I know. I, I've seen two great examples. So one out of mining and one, like another one out yeah. of retail. Um, it was a large Australian grocer that in the lifts, you go into their building and they mm. had the metrics on the lift, Yeah. in the lift. So, you, you know, when you stand in the lift, you kind of watch the numbers, but some people were turning around and seeing the month on month change. Yeah. So that communication is key. Uh, it also shows that everyone's bought in, right? Mm. If someone's given approval to stick some metric on the lift in their corporate head office, yeah. that means there's buy-in at that senior leadership. Um, uh, you know, a dashboard that you're running, um, you know, um, okay, so no one's got any visibility. Another story from my, uh, from uh, manufacturing, actually, I walked in the CPO's office and I chatted to him about scorecards and he had this huge TV, uh, not dissimilar to the one that's in this room, it's like 80 inch. Yeah. And he spins it around and he says, have a look at this, Hunty. Yeah. And he showed me each of the metrics that he'd been measuring and he was watching each one, Yeah. right? So monthly, he wanted that dashboard scorecard refreshed and he wanted to show whether it was red, yellow, or green. And where it was red, he would double click on it, pick up the phone and speak to the user that hadn't executed the task and say, hey, uh, Fergal, why haven't you done your homework, right? And, yeah. and, and that would drive and Well, that was my next question. So acknowledgement and consequences. So acknowledgement for doing the, for being on top and consequences if you don't. Absolutely. So assuming that's... Uh, so let me move to one of the keys. Yeah. Um, uh, this one. I told you I'd make you jump around. No, no, I appreciate that. <laughs> so motivation. Um, motivation's cool, but it's also, it can, it, it can be uh, misused. Um, mm -hmm. I think motivation around recognition is important to people from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, if you say to me, hey, you did a great job today on our yeah. webinar, yeah. That'll be, that will mean a lot, right? But yeah. if you said to me, hey, here's a here's 100 bucks for doing a yeah. good job, that will mean more, right, yeah. um, to some. Um, so what I've seen in the motivation space is, uh, you know, uh, having clear uh, understanding of what needs to happen to be successful, yeah. um, celebrating it, whether it's a lunch um, or public recognition, uh, if you can, you know, get a plaque or a mm. pen or uh, if there's an annual award ceremony. Um, I've seen this really cool concept in a previous organization where they had an appreciate program. Yeah. And it got abused, but it was cool because it meant that individuals that were going over and above could send each other messages that their boss would see. Yeah. Um, so imagine if, you know, I sent you a note about uh, Tom 
saying what a wonderful C CEO he is, right? Yeah. Suddenly he knows that you've seen a note that I've sent about how great he is. And that's important to him because when it becomes time for his performance review or, you know, annual, annual discussions around comp, he's going to know that, you know, he's done a terrific job. Yeah. And I think that motivation is key. Yeah, I think you've answered my question there. Good one. Yeah. Thank you. I hope I didn't jump around too much. No. Um, well, let me ask the other side of it then. So what if someone's not doing their, not fulfilling their... Well, their, their, oh, that's the tricky rights. one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've seen a mixture of yeah. like uh, performance reviews, performance management plans. I've yeah. seen, um, you know, uh, you know, carrot stick. Um, I, I don't know if I've got the answer for yeah. this one. I think... Being compassionate to what people are dealing with is critical. Mm. Um, I think what I've seen in the last couple of years particularly is people are dealing with uh, a more fragile environment in which they're living. Yeah. Um, everyone's transitioning back to the office or they're trying to justify living uh, remotely and, and delivering remotely. And I think that that's tough. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more pressure to do what I think we used to be able to do um, uh, daily uh, in a more intact uh, community yeah so i'm i'm leaning more to the compassionate side yeah. uh, and trying to support the individuals that are struggling uh to get their uh, to find their feet to get their confidence and free them up to focus uh on on delivering um, so uh, yeah. yeah i don't know if that answers your no, question i think it's a it's a good yeah, yeah. answer um good one did i see a question uh, no, I don't think so. I was just checking. Any more questions or comments from the from the audience? Have we got anything? No, I don't think so. All right, brilliant. Um, okay, so the next one's around process adjustments. And this one comes, this story comes from uh, mining oil and gas. So a few years ago, uh, the company I was working with were looking to enhance their expediting process. Yep. Uh, and that's really about following up on orders that have gone out yeah. and seeing when the, the product's due to be delivered. Uh, and they were moving from a legacy system to a new system and no one really wanted to change, right? So everyone knew how the old system worked. The way that the new system worked was, you know, foreign and confusing and, um, you know, it was like the fog of war. Yeah. And uh, so what I saw happen what worked really well is the process steps were just mapped on a whiteboard uh, and it was 15 steps down to five, right? So the visualization of the simplification uh, really told its own story. So suddenly all the detractors that were, you know, not really on board were able to say, okay, so it's now simpler. Okay, we'll get over the different screens. Um, it does the same thing. It's going to simplify our life. So the mm -hmm. process adjustment is really key. Um, sometimes I think we just keep on doing what we've always done. Yeah. Um, but once we deliver a new tool or a new integration uh, or AI, uh, we're going to see that a lot of the things that we've done traditionally um, are, are simplified. So that process adjustment, was that co-developed or co-created or was the process, was the whiteboard done and then shown to people or were they involved in the process? Because my view is, you know, if you can include people in the, the process, that helps even more. Yeah, I'm with you, 100%. Yeah. Um, there was inclusion eventually. Uh, yeah. There was a lot of animosity and uh, miscommunication and, um, uh, you know, uh, resistance to the change prior to the visualisation yeah. steps. But the way that the whiteboarding was done, it was, so what, what's the steps that we do now? And everyone got the chance to sort of show how amazing they are and their yeah. knowledge and their, their unique experience. And then the, you know, the future state was articulated, you know, pretty quickly with, okay, so this is what's coming. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. And then everyone was like, all right, cool. Well, that's, that makes sense. You know? Uh, yeah. Was it done on a whiteboard for a particular reason? And the reason I'm asking is that that's more tactile than something that's uh, put on a digital whiteboard, for for example, or in a digital... I guess the story yeah. is old. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the whiteboarding is kind of a lost art, you know? I, no, I, 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 it's a serious question. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really important that you can have people stand around together it's a it's a much more communal um, I, I love it yeah. yeah i still use it and butcher's paper you yeah. know like yeah. if you can get that sort of experience that physical it's like picking up a book yeah. you know it's 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 nice yeah. uh, because you've got pages you've got something real someone can draw someone can laugh yeah. at how bad their drawing is you know 
but it, it meant that everyone could sit about a table, they could visualize it, all argue what the steps were. Mm. And it was a it was an open, um, free um, uh, exchange of information. Everyone was encouraged. Yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes, you know, we're putting, implementing these systems and we're the IT department or we're the, you know, we're, we're the management or we're the people in the office and the users are going to be out in the field. Absolutely. They're going to be out on trucks or they're going to be out on mobile devices with dust all over them. Uh, so they're in a tactile environment. They're in a moving environment. They're in a, um, you know, a, 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 real a environment. VUCA environment, you know, it's a volatile environment. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to present uh, things that are that are tactile and they can touch. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, a story I like to tell is uh, a large uh, warehouse mm -hmm. in a remote location a few years ago. We were rolling out um, a relabeling and barcode scanning solution mm -hmm. for the users, and it was a fairly expensive program because it was eighty million dollar um, stock in the yeah. warehouse. Got a large, dusty, hot, um, you know very um, uh, you know, dangerous environment and uh, some of the engagement included. So what, what would work for you as the, you know, warehouse staff mm -hmm. um, as you go about trying to find the, the equipment and, and inventory that you're looking for? And the user came back and said, oh, it'd be great if we could have all the labels here and they could be uh, laminated and we could scan them. And, and so we got these great scanners and it was early in, in, in barcoding yeah. uh, technology and Wi-Fi was fairly new, but they were able to scan. Anyway, um, we deployed the program and everyone sort of popped the champagne and, and celebrated. But six months later, I came out to have a look how it was going. Yeah. And all of the scanners were sitting in a box in the corner um, all the labeling are being done and, and some of the processes enhancements were being adopted. But overall, these $6,000 scanners, there was about 10 of them and they're all sitting in a box. Yeah. So I was like, what's going on with the scanners? And uh, one of the guys that was uh, in this location, that everyone plays football, right? Mm -hmm. And so most of them had big fat fingers that have been broken a couple yeah. of times. So when it came to using the scanners, their fingers were just too big for yeah. the buttons. And so when it came eventually to become apparent, we need scanners with bigger buttons. It was that simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one. Just mindful that we're on 50 minutes. Um, Why don't I pull over and see if there's some, uh, some questions? Up to you. Yeah, we can. Yeah. We can if we've got questions, uh, let's maybe throw them through now. Um, and... Uh, you can keep going, but we've got we've got another ten minutes. I think people are everybody. You haven't had many people drop off, so I think people are interested, Andrew. Which is which Good. is which is that's a relief. Which is great. <laughs> um, while while we're waiting for some questions, if they come through, tell us a little bit about your business now and how people how can people get in contact with you. Well, thanks, Google. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I'm exploring is who who can I partner with? Yeah. Um, and uh, how can I grow the business? Mm. Um, you know, so if you're interested in having a chat, um, I'll do a like a 15 minute discussion. Um, just reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, Andrew Hunt. Um, yeah. The company's Authentic Advisory. You can go to my website, authenticadvisory.com.au. Right. Um, ping me, um, and I'll, I'll I'll come back to you. I tend to what I tend to do is either um, do a couple day workshop um, yeah. for those that are interested. Um, we could do it remote or I can come to you. I prefer to do face-to-face. -face. Um, I think you just get better engagement and understanding. Yeah. Um, what I call discovery is really where I get to discover what your pain is. So what are you yeah. struggling with? And and I, um, oh, there's a question. From, I know I'm going to ask a question. From, from from Kurt. Uh, so do you want me to ask the question? Yeah, yeah, okay. go for it. So Kurt Benavides, thanks, Kurt. Uh, Andrew, in your experience, what is the best way to achieve the sweet spot where all different foundations for transformation presented overlap and how to manage trade-off between them? By experience, it's hard to have them all. Is there a subset of them that are a minimum requirement? Now, I ask Kurt not to ask a tricky <laughs> question, uh, but in all seriousness, I think it depends. And, yeah. that, and I know that sounds like a copy out, but... Um, if you're a, um, as I mentioned before, the civil aviation, they said that historically their programs around comms has always been their weak spot. Yeah. So they wanted the focus for all of the transformation to be on their comms program. Um, I think if, and it, it, 
if we talk about that vision and justification, if it's a reset that we're doing, then that's primary. It needs that that needs to be there. Um, another story I like to tell around executive buy-in, and this goes to our kind of commentary before around, uh, you know, sometimes software is developed with the users in mind. Yeah. So if the user experience, it's all about user experience, that's great. But I've seen an example recently where the customer, the, the company that have deployed this software ain't getting paid, right? Yeah. So they need to get paid. And the reason they're not getting paid is the senior executive leadership don't know what it does and they don't care, mm. right? They've got a corporate initiative that is all about um, simplification around uh, providers, but the user experience that the users are loving uh, that has been developed with them in mind um, has, you know, the engagement's been at a, a, a more tactical level, right? Mm. So it needs to be at that uh, that top level as we discussed before. Um, so Kurt, I think personas is important. Uh, and to the to the slide around personas is this one. Um, you know, I was having a chat at a conference in China a couple of years ago, and there was 300 uh, companies there. And they were translating because my Australian Chinese ain't great. Mm. Uh, but what they were saying was, um, you know, as I was listening to the translation, what I was saying was, hey, uh, you might uh, be, you know, the biggest entities in China. And you may own the tenements uh, that uh, is going to bring your shareholders or your government um, um, uh, leaders the revenue that they're after. But your most important assets, your people. And I think that resonated with the audience because they all clapped, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I think when you think about uh, the people as your most important asset, and we're trying and, and we're introducing technology that's going to make some of their roles obsolete, it's a fine balance that we need to dance uh, in order to make sure that we're looking after our communities and freeing up people to do more interesting, sustainable uh, activities. Uh, so Kurt, if I had to pick three, I'd say vision and justification, um, you know, uh, make sure the messaging's clear uh, and, and, you know, probably the embracement plan, which I haven't really talked too much, but if it ain't embraced, there's no... There's no technology. There's no change. Yeah. So I hope that helps, mate. What I haven't talked to you about this, what I like about this, and I'm guessing is obviously you've got a wealth of experience clearly with, with you know, what, you, what you've shared today. But I guess part of it is the wisdom of going in, assessing a situation and saying, right, you know, here's the, here's the, the foundations. I'm going to need X, Y, Z here. Here's the combination that's going to work for this specific example. Would that be? Very yeah, cool. that's and that's why I ask everyone to write down their number out of 10, because I may have a perspective that mm. will give, you know, I say, hey, we should focus on this. But if if every if I, I've done it in a room with 20 people from the same organization, they've all got different scores yes. for each of their foundations of change. So then what do you do? Well, in my opinion, take the average, yeah. right? Or you go with the senior exec that says <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, 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 that's yeah, what we're yeah. focusing on. Um, yeah, so yeah. That's, okay, yeah. let me move on. I've got another question. Um, so hi, Andrew. How do you overcome the challenge of people feeling overwhelmed with another important project on top of, uh, what was it? On top of my day-to-day -day responsibilities. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I think there should be a BAU and a project uh, org chart yeah. um, and all, all, all hierarchy. So imagine if it's a 12 month program of work yeah. and you're being asked to do your day-to-day -day activities, uh, but, you're not, but you're also being asked to contribute to projects. Yeah. Um, and I've been, ex I've, exposed to, I've been exposed to this one myself. Um, you've got to do your day job, but by the way, you're also doing this and, and you're doing that. Um, yeah. So I think, I think, uh, being given permission to focus a period of your day uh, to achieve the outcomes needs to be clearly articulated uh, right up through to your leadership. Um, if the leadership is saying we need you to do A on top of your B, uh, that's a tricky one. And I think, uh, you know, that's a conversation that needs to be that needs to be had. Yeah. Um, sometimes it may mean you need to sprint for a period. 
Um, and that's a judgment that you need to make. Um, is you know, Does it make sense for you to stay late or get in early uh, for a period? And I think sometimes it does, right? Um, it's, there's no, you're the, you're commander of your own destiny. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, Personally, um, it's it's I like to do that extra period for a time um, in order to achieve the result you need to achieve. Okay. So people like what you've presented. We've got the foundations. We'll make we know we've only kind of touched on some of them, we haven't touched on all of them, but we'll make this deck available available to them. Sure. What are the takeaways? What's next for someone who wants to, you know, use these? Uh I think having a look at the key, uh, the the foundations for change is the key. Yeah. Um, giving yourself a rating, um, that's where I would start. Yeah. Um, if you want me to do it with you, happy to do that and have a conversation. Yeah. Um, if they'd like to engage me to uh, do a workshop, um, you know, or prepare for a workshop, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'll leave it open for maybe another sixty seconds if we have any other questions. I always like to get people off within the hour, but we've got four minutes remaining. So any last last questions, please shoot them through. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll thank Andrew for his time, and um, we will announce our next webinar in um, in in the next few weeks, which which will be around integration. Uh, a couple of thank yous coming in. So Kurt says thanks very much, Andrew. I see Tom's thanking you. Uh, Eamon's thanking you. So great conversation. Thanks for the practical uh, advice and uh, good to talk to you. You too. Thanks so much. Thanks. Cheers.